hello everyone. Uh, this uh, this week we are going to discuss um, privacy preserving contact tracing uh, to cope with the current crisis of uh, the COVID nineteen virus, and uh, we'll discuss the technical. So we'll discuss the technical aspects of contact tracing in general. Uh, the challenges to gain trust among the population, um, uh, for instance, in terms of privacy preserving and in terms of uh, robustness and resi uh, uh, resilience to, 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 to malfunctioning. Um, so let's let's first start with uh, maybe this ex explaining the, the protocol. And, uh, maybe um, we can start first with the motivation. And, uh, yeah, okay. Let's let's yeah. let's maybe yeah, begin with the motivation. Go ahead. Yeah, so uh, so as you probably know, currently there's a pandemic uh, due to uh, a disease called uh, COVID-19. And the reason why this is very uh, problem hard to, to, to address is that uh, COVID-19 is extremely contagious. Uh, and this makes like the exponential growth that you've probably heard about. But what makes uh, COVID-19 particularly uh, more trickier than a lot of other diseases is that COVID-19 is actually contagious, uh, especially for like at least uh, a lot for people who don't have the symptoms right uh, yet. Like you can be contagious even though you don't have any symptom. So it can be very hard for you, for you to know that you should be a lot more careful and maybe you should stay home uh, because if you go outside then maybe you can uh, transmit the disease to somebody else. And, and this is extremely problematic because as soon as you are not careful, then the number of people you contaminate can be larger than one. And if it's larger than one, then you have this exponential growth and essentially the, the, the disease is uh, out of control. So if you want to uh, make sure that there's not this exponential growth, that uh, the, the pandemic will be uh, contained, uh, what you really want to do is to make sure that anybody who's at risk will be staying at home and self-isolate. This is, by the way, the recommendation by uh, the World Health Organization, and uh, many epidemiologists uh, agree with this. And, and and this is, by the way, how how some countries were a bit more successful, such as Taiwan, which yeah. arguably ha has the best management so far of the crisis, because yeah. uh, because people were tested very early and and quarantined uh, very early. Yeah. And so to do uh, contact tracing, what people usually do, uh, so, so the idea of contact tracing is that you should try, you should try to identify who is likely to have the COVID-19 by looking at uh, what are the, the infected people, uh, the people who got tested positive uh, to COVID-19 and who these people who are now infect, uh, tested positive were in contact with uh, a few days ago and may have uh, transmitted the disease to. Uh, and usually you can do this, uh, well, and still now you can do this uh, with uh, by hand with humans. Like you can take someone who's positive and you can ask him, who did you get into in contact with over the last few days? Mm -hmm. But the problem with this is that it, it's, it's slow. It's also very costly. You need a lot of manpower to gather this information. And it's, uh, uh, well, there are flaws because people can misremember or people have, Bad memories, unfortunately, like uh, the human brain is has a is well, it's not the best storage system. And the idea of uh, what we're going to talk about today is uh, electronic contact tracing, mm -hmm. namely uh, the idea of making sure that this contact tracing is done by uh, algorithmic solutions, in particular by your phones. And DP3T is a particular protocol to achieve this while guaranteeing a high level of privacy and security. Actually, I, I, be, I believe the motivations are not well uh, communicated Understood. and understood. So you mentioned the exponential growth and uh, maybe we can spend some time on how much non-intuitive an exponential growth it is, even for the most educated scientists. I don't know if Louis, you want to, com to comment on the non-intuitive part of an exponential growth and why we should be really very careful and and not be overconfident as uh, for example Angela Merkel warned two days ago yeah so uh, to explain to my friends I use this uh, uh, famous uh, enigma uh, puzzle that I heard a long time ago is that uh, in, a, in the middle of a lake there is a, a flower that doubles the size every single day after 31 days 
it, it covers the size of the of the lake. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And the question is, uh, at what point, to, at what day did it uh, cover half of the lake? So the answer to the question is, uh, sometimes people would say after half the time, so after 15 days. But the correct answer is that it was just one day before covering the full lake. It was covering half the lake. And now I, I, I put this in parallel with the how hospital are how full are the hospital right now due to the pandemic? Mm -hmm. And uh, I at a, at some point in time the pandemic was growing uh, with at least doubling every three days. And mm -hmm. uh, when the hospital are still a uh, uh, fifty percent full, the problem is that the everyone would have the impression that oh we still have a lot most more than half of the hospital are free we we still mm -hmm. have a lot of capacity, and and it took at it, we have been talking for COVID for one month now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It took one month to get hospital half full, so we are not at risk at all. But mm -hmm. this is untrue. Uh, to relate to the, the case of the flower and the lake, mm -hmm. uh, half full capacity is happening three days before the hospital are overwhelmed with uh, this mm -hmm. patient. So, so yeah, yeah. If, it takes, if it takes one month to get half the hospitals full, it will it, just take three additional days yeah, to get exactly. them 100% full. And this mm -hmm. is why it's really not intuitive. To, to deal with exponentials, and yeah. um, um, so so uh, maybe uh, if uh, I don't know if you want to comment on um, on the efficiency that of of contact tracing in the case of Taiwan, or or we may just go ahead and discuss the protocol. Uh, yeah. So what what I want to stress is uh, well I'm going to talk about something else but uh, what I want to stress is that it's not only about saving uh, the lives directly caused by uh, COVID-19 uh -huh. uh, the current uh, lockdown in um, most like in all developed countries uh, nearly all developed countries in the world mm -hmm. is uh, putting a lot of uh, of stress on a lot of different things like mm -hmm. it's not no longer only about uh, healthcare okay. uh, now it's affecting the way Businesses are working, like yeah. uh, companies are in shutdown for, for months. Yeah. Most of them cannot afford this, yeah. many of them at, at least. Uh, some of them have to uh, to to ask for loans uh, to, just to, to stay uh, alive. Yeah. Uh, if it's if the, the lockdown carries on for, for, for more months or if there's a, a second uh, confinement yeah. because there's a second wave of yeah. the pandemics, then many of them will probably have to declare uh, bankruptcy and this will lead to a lot of unemployment so like if you like in the us uh, right now it's particularly uh, critical like there are, are tens of millions i don't know what the figures are right now uh, really, like 16 million, million at least i heard uh, yeah, no. yeah and yeah. Uh, talking about exponentials it was 6 million and then a few days ago it was 16 million so it almost tripled yeah so all of this is also growing exponentially and the risk of growing exponentially mm -hmm. so that's why it's uh, extremely important to avoid like potentially major risks mm. that we think about uh, uh, the confinement and hopefully doing this not in the too distant future. Mm. But it has to be safe. Like it's critical that mm. it's a safe uh, well, de confinement. Ju just yeah. a point about economy because uh, people hear a lot about uh, this dilemma between saving the economy and saving lives. And unfortunately, there are some people who are arguing for saving the economy with sometimes the wrong arguments. Uh, actually, uh, they're not like contradicting objectives. And uh, and if, if we have unemployment figures raising, we would eventually have deaths and suicides and and, and yeah. several health. Like in many countries, people's health care is tied to their employment so if they lose their employment they lose their health care and um, uh, also yeah. like there are many side effects of being under lockdown for example uh, domestic violence like uh, yeah. is on the rise according to many public health agencies and this is also something that is a side effect of pro like prolongated long -term. so looking for a shortening uh, lockdown is not only motivated by basic greedy economic motivation, but also life-saving economic motivation. So, yeah. So, so people have like we, we really have to take time and think about that. There, those are not contradicting objectives. Saving the economy and saving lives are not necessarily always contradictive. Yeah. 
Okay. And it's not about the the rich. I mean, the rich uh, people are going yeah, to be yeah, fine. They, they this is about poor people who are, exactly. are homeless or don't have a, a exactly. great housing. And so you see, you see videos from poor countries where where some people are literally uh, asking for the release uh, so that they stop being hungry. And uh, not yeah. everyone has a safety net and the salary that is popping up at the end of the month while being remotely working. Yeah. So that's why it's really important to to think about how to make deconfinement, but it's also critical to make it safe. And uh, that's why anything that can help sh should be at least considered. And in particular, contact tracing is estimated to to, to have a, a non-negligible impact. Yeah. It's not going to be life saving, but yeah. it's not going to be uh, like completely changing the game. Yeah. But it can arguably like yeah, I've made some rough calculations based on on, on the estimations of pre-symptomatic contaminations, contaminations by people who don't have yet the symptoms. And if you can reduce this, uh, like uh, even by uh, by fifty percent then it can reduce dramatically, uh, or even by 20%, it can reduce dramatically the contamination numbers, the reproduction numbers, so the number of people every person mm -hmm. contaminates. And this can like, this can reduce uh, the, the lockdown by, by, by months or like uh, accelerate it by months, or it can prevent a second confinement. And, and this may save in the end, uh, maybe hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people. So it's really, really critical. To, to to do to at least consider contact tracing yeah. and for this uh, we need to do it right okay so maybe now let's uh, let's move to the protocol and maybe just discuss the basics and then discuss specific ones such as uh, uh, dp3t so okay yeah so mm -hmm. the basic idea of uh, contact tracing it's uh, that as we all have a smartphone uh, with us uh, as most of the population has a smartphone with them uh, at all time uh, smartphone will be communicating with one another and uh, and and register which other smartphone they get uh, close to. Mm -hmm. Then when someone uh, uh, feels sick and uh, make a test and they realize that uh, he's, uh, he's uh, infected with a COVID-19 uh, disease, mm -hmm. then uh, he will publish on an online database uh, its, uh, uh, let, let's say, its name. Mm -hmm. And uh, other phones that registered that they, they went close to that person mm -hmm. would then be able to know that they were in contact with someone that was sick, uh, plus or minus a few timestamps to know at what time this happened. And then uh, uh, people who were, who were close to someone that got sick will receive a notification on their phone telling them, uh, you are at risk, you should uh, maybe confine yourself or uh, get yourself tested to know. Mm -hmm. And well, uh, one advantage of this contact tracing also that we didn't mention yet is that uh, the regular contact tracing without a, without digital technology, when we simply ask uh, the sick person who she has been in contact with, it uh, it not only has problem of uh, memory or, or this kind of human problem, but also that uh, there are a lot of people that you pass by uh, every day with a, but you don't know them, so you will never be able to to recall and, uh, mm -hmm. and point to them. For example, mm -hmm. the person you, you were next to in line in the supermarket, the person you mm -hmm. sat by in the, at the cinema, the person you sat next to you in the bus, all of these you, you, you don't know. But if your phones are able to detect that they have been in contact, then, uh, then this person will be, we will be able to notify this person and uh, so it makes it uh, a lot more efficient. Um. Maybe uh, I'll just show the uh, a cartoon made by Nikki Case and um, with the help of Professor Carmela Troncoso from EPFL. So this is a cartoon about how it works. And uh, especially in the, so this is so, so this is a very general uh, uh, representation. I think it's helpful to understand the core ideas behind all all like most of contact tracing apps. So this is what you explained. Uh, Alice's phone. So our phones are always like broadcasting a, a signal to antennas, etc. But here, in this case, uh, it will be through Bluetooth, so they will be just broadcasting them. Yeah. Yes. Uh, what I didn't say is that uh, this doesn't work by uh, sending your name to every phone that passes by next to you, but exactly, it, it exactly. works so, using uh, 
a random generated a randomly generated key and uh, uh -huh. and IDs that will be updated every few minutes. Uh, this is made so to to avoid that uh, uh, leaking outside around you too many uh, too much private information. So yeah, so if, if you take this case for example, so this phone is broadcasting those uh, random five L P O M K etc. And 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 when the two phone owner, owners met, they exchanged those messages and they keep track. They keep track of all the random stuff they receive. So both phones remember what they said and heard in the past 14 days. Of course, the 14 days can be tuned depending on what epidemiologists and virologists know about the virus and depending how the knowledge on the virus is updated. Um, so and then uh, if one of these people, so you can imagine many people meeting many people. So so this is your phone. It has it keeps track of what all of the random stuff that 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 it broadcasted, and then it keeps track of all the random messages that were received by nearby devices. And then when when someone is diagnosed positive in a hospital. They send so uh, so she sends the, the the message to a hospital. It can be a hospital. It can be a public health authority. It can be uh, any abstraction that that you can put here that is not necessarily a hospital. Uh, and then uh, so here uh, you have a database of what COVID nineteen positive cases said. And and then uh, Bob, who who happened to be sitting next to Alice earlier. Uh, could so he, actually not Bob manually, but the app, the, the protocol, the algorithm would compare the public record of of the random messages said by COVID positive people. But the algorithm would recognize the messages, and then it would recognize that it sat next to someone with COVID. And it's important to highlight here that this is not enough and absolutely not enough for for Bob to to identify uh, uh, Alice. So and then Bob would just then. If, if, if it's received in messages, it's like, for example, saying that, okay, you received this, uh, so you have uh, two hours of exposure to COVID positive in less than some meters, it means that Bob should also self-isolate. And with this, we would divide by two. For example, if, if Alice self-isolates because she was tested positive in a hospital, and Bob also self-isolates, we will divide by two the the potential spread from 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 the Alice case. So uh, to uh, to conclude on the on the discussing the efficiency of uh, of such a technique, what uh, what's important to to understand is that this technique would be uh, efficient uh, proportionally to the square of the number of the proportion of the people that are using it. Yeah. When, uh, the way to understand this is that uh, every time a contact happens. The probability that we detect this contact, it will be the probability that the the first sick person uh, as is using the app multiplied by the the chances that the second person is also using the app. So uh, this leads to, for example, if uh, seventy percent of the population is using this uh, contact tracing app, we would get uh, seventy percent to the square, so uh, forty nine percent approximately. Uh, it will so it will detect approximately half of the contacts, and. Uh, and we can expect it to reduce the exponential growth of the, of the pandemic. Yeah. But uh, on the other hand, if only 10% of the of the population using it uses it, then it only detects 1% of the of the contacts. So it would be uh, in that case not worth it to to use such an app. Yeah. Yeah. The effectiveness of contact tracing is critically dependent on uh, its wide adoption. And uh, fortunately, like right now, it's still very hard to to foresee how many, what is the fraction of the people who are actually going to use it. Uh, a scary number is that in uh, in uh, in Singapore, there was like uh, around twenty percent of uh, of users of, of people in Singapore using this app uh, at least uh, in the beginning of April. I don't know if the figures went up. Uh, I know. I hope mm -hmm. they did. Uh, so if we want this solution to be effective, it's extremely important that we communicate well around this uh, and that uh, it's, it's, like it's people gain trust in the system and they're willing to, to use it uh, unless it's made mandatory. Uh, that could be a, a, another way to go. 
but uh, so far it seems like there's a, a strong push. Maybe it's going to change, but there's a strong push for for this not to be uh, mandatory. Um, yeah, so that, there's a big challenge here in terms of, of, of communication. But uh, the the other challenge is that if you want to convince people to use this app, and then it's also extremely important for it to have guarantees of privacy. Well, it's important in, in general, I guess, but if, especially in this case, like uh, privacy and, and very good privacy is extremely important so that it's like, uh, like people really think it's a good application and also because it's going to be allowed, it's going to allow uh, to protect the different users and uh, DP3T in particular uh, gives a huge emphasis on, on privacy. And a lot of the protocols are designed so that uh, even, uh, so there are two kinds of attacks you can think of on the, on the system. One kind is, is called uh, curious but honest. Uh, so this would be typically spies, like people who are trying to find information by uh, poking into the system. And then there's, there's this other kind of, of, of bad user, which is, which is a user that tries to, to screw up the system. Uh, sometimes we call them uh, uh, Byzantines uh, in, uh, in computer science. And you want the system to be robust to both of these uh, kind of attacks. Mm -hmm. So in terms of privacy, uh, the main trick is this uh, idea of uh, random uh, ephemeral identifiers. Mm -hmm. uh, that we've already uh, talked about. Um, and uh, well, they, I guess there are a few additional tricks and subtleties uh, maybe that I won't get into. Uh, but uh, as well, I think uh, the Byzantine resilience uh, mm -hmm. of the system is extremely important. Uh, mm -hmm. And it has been uh, criticized uh, like may maybe the system is not going to be resilient enough because mm -hmm. typically the basic attack is that uh, uh, anyone can create a lot of identities and just say publicly that it uh, has uh, contracted COVID-19 mm -hmm. so that it scares a lot of people and makes this, the system eventually uh, not reliable. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is prevented by using, uh, uh, essentially you need uh, a proof that you have been tested to the COVID-19 to be able to say that you actually uh, uh, mm -hmm. contracted the COVID-19. And this is based on uh, an interaction with uh, health and agencies. Mm -hmm. But there can be other kinds of attacks, for instance, uh, replay or relay uh, uh, attacks. So essentially, uh, as soon as you see a name appears, so one, one kind of attack is as soon as you see a name appear in the list of uh, COVID-19 uh -huh. confirmed cases, you can, based on this information, you can compute the ephemeral ideas of the people who contracted the COVID-19 and you can replay uh, the, or relay these, uh, these uh, ephemeral ideas to uh, scare people off so that people will, will think that they've been in contact with this ephemeral exactly. idea that's associated to someone who has contracted the COVID-19. And this can create uh, well, a lot of people scared for, for, no, for, for bad reasons. Yeah. yeah, so having all of this, defending against all of these attacks is really a big challenge. Uh, and uh, I think DP3T did an excellent job at, at mitigating a lot of these uh, challenges. But uh, yeah, my, my main concern right now is about this Byzantine resilience. Uh, you can imagine that this system is not going to be uh, very popular among some, some communities that may maybe fear uh, some uh, privacy uh, uh, issues with this uh, app, or maybe they just don't like technology in general. And I, th I think we should fear that some people will try to screw up the system because of this. And because of this, I, like, I would be more confident if the, the system was more Byzantine resilient. Uh, but maybe if you want to really guarantee that it's more Byzantine resilient, then you need to sacrifice uh, something else, uh, maybe in terms of privacy. For, for my experience in researching Byzantine resilience and fault tolerance in general, uh, everything has been equal. It's harder to achieve it if you also want to preserve privacy and vice versa. It's, it's harder to achieve Byzantine resilience if you, so harder to receive, to achieve Byzantine resilience if you want to achieve more privacy and it's harder to achieve 
more privacy if you want to to, uh, to achieve more uh, fault tolerance because and again this is very high level specific situations can make this change but in general when you want to achieve privacy you want to obfuscate who is saying what and when you want to achieve fault tolerance and being resilient to malicious inputs etc you want to spot misleading input from the group of other inputs and by spotting it you might de-anonymize it yeah. so it's a very hard challenge to combine privacy preserving and business reason it's not impossible but it is it's it's extremely hard yeah yeah it makes a lot of intuitive sense like if you trying to set up an organization hmm. uh, if you want to make sure the organization with people i mean hmm. if you want to make sure the organization is is working well hmm. intuitively the more you know the different people and uh, hmm. the strengths and the vulnerabilities the more you can make your system robust and, and, and secure uh, but uh, conversely, uh, uh, this means also that you're going to well, learn more about the other people, which is uh, mm. a violation of privacy. Exactly. Yeah, so I think for these kind of things, it's important that uh, we're not being too uh, deontological. I, I think it's, it, things are not going to be black and white. Like It's not... Uh, there's not going to be like fully privacy, fully uh, robust to Byzantines. And um, mm -hmm. I think there are trade-offs and we need to acknowledge that there are trade-offs and maybe express our different preferences regarding these trade-offs. Mm -hmm. And uh, another thing is to uh, do not, like it's important not to lose sight of the fact that um, in the end, there's also an effectiveness uh, uh, problem. You, you want the application to be effective at uh, identifying uh, contacts between uh, infected people and, and uh, susceptible people. And yeah, I think it's important to take all of this into account mm -hmm. when judging whether this application, in particular DP3T, uh, let, let's say, uh, should be uh, widely promoted, should be widely used and, and stuff like this or not. Mm -hmm. And now maybe uh, another challenge that we would have is uh, the multiplicity of protocols and applications. Yeah. Uh, because as we explained in the beginning, the power of contact tracing grows quadratically with the number of people who adopt it. So again, if, 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 if you move from 10 to 20, you don't double the efficiency, but you multiply it by four. So uh, keeping that in mind, you, you would like the contact tracing protocol used inside a geographic region to be widely adopted and ideally interoperating. So, so that we're not a pocket of people using protocol A and another pocket of people using protocol B and app B. And, and this is a very hard challenge now we face where uh, the multiplicity of protocols and app can, could also be a, a barrier to, to the effic efficiency of contact tracing. So what do, do you say about yeah. that? Yeah, at the time we're speaking, uh, there's a, a proposal from a French uh, and German uh, uh, computer science organizations uh, mm -hmm. about uh, an alternative the protocol. INRIA and uh, the Fraunhofer, yeah. Fraunhofer Institute and INRIA from one hand, and then you have to... Yeah, yeah. Uh, they propose mm -hmm. an alternative to uh, DP3T uh, called uh, uh, Robert. Uh, so we haven't had uh, time to, to read the details so far. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, it was just so, posted today, I think. Yeah, it was just posted uh, today. And uh, I think there are like differences that are important enough so that they are not like clearly compatible, uh, the two of them. So uh, at some point, like, I think there needs to be a, uh, there's a coordination problem. Like uh, maybe I think in the future, there may be different proposals. So I think so far, like it's fine to have a, mm -hmm. a lot of different research. I think it's even desirable because like maybe you haven't exactly. explored uh, all solutions so far, but at some point when you move to deployment, it's important mm -hmm. that there's a there's an coordination problem and you don't want people to split between these two different apps because of the quadratic. So, uh, so uh, ideally, you would like a thread of deployment that is global and centralized, and multiple threads of of exploration research that should be cut three in the. That 
but where there is consensus about one protocol, ideally this protocol should be should be should be the one deployed. And uh, and this this raises another challenge, which is very general, which is global governance. And we've seen it with the World Health. Like we are very fortunate to to live in an era where we have the World Health Organization, despite all what we can say about about how it did not or did maybe something uh, less good than it should have been done, etc. Uh, if we didn't have a central global organization such as the World Health Organization, the, the, the World Health Organization, I think this pandemic would be a nightmare. We have examples from the past. <laughs> where, yeah, where... Uh, yeah. So, so I would strongly argue as well that uh, the, uh, the World Health Organization has been critical in relaying information uh, calling for for stronger measures, uh, hmm. uh, so I guess, and uh, and this kind of coordination is, uh, is, is is a huge challenge, and it's going to be important, uh, hmm. uh, especially for. So, so we we could imagine, for example, so research going on independently, several research groups coming up with different protocols, but in deployments, ideally, it should be, for example, the health authority in Switzerland that. That, that organizes the deployment in Switzerland and the health organization in France organizing the deployment in, in, in France, etc. And eventually, uh, when when they come up with improvements on each deployment, they have interoperating apps because eventually borders would be opened and people would be traveling again. Uh, and this might happen sooner than vaccines arrive. Yeah. So One thing we didn't mention about the contact tracing app also is that uh, a second goal of uh, this project, uh, DP3T, is to uh, collect data from, uh, from, but on a voluntary basis, from whoever using the app would be to accept to, wow. uh, to, to give this data to epidemiologists. Because today, uh, we are collecting uh, already quite a lot of data, but uh, somehow there is also a, a, a delay between the, the data we are collecting and what really happens, because we collect mm -hmm. data on a um, most likely a patient that already go to the hospital or already have symptoms and it comes after five, six days of, uh, of uh, being infected. So mm -hmm. using these apps, if uh, epi uh, epidemiologists would have the opportunity to, to collect much more interesting data, data that's more on time. And uh, for example, as we, we were discussing, uh, dif different measures to, to reduce the confinement over time. And mm -hmm. if we want to know if we are doing the right thing, we want very quick feedback on the, on the measure we are taking. Like if we reopen the cinemas, yeah. we want to to right away know, uh, was it a mistake? Uh, should we should, should we go back? But the problem in the, with the data we collect to today, yeah. the problem we is that we will know six days later and because of exponential growth uh, parameters, uh, uh, it would already be a, a huge mistake by the time. So we yeah, yeah, sorry, we, we will know, but with a delay that is, uh, extraordinarily dangerous. So mm -hmm. we would know, but with the six days delay, which is given the exponential we kept repeating uh, since the beginning, would be a, a dangerous delay. Yeah, actually, yeah, and arguably the delay is uh, is longer than this because mm -hmm. exactly. if you look at the so confirmed cases, then it's we'll say 14 days, and, and yeah, maybe more in the order of 14 days than on the order of six days. Right. Yeah. So yeah, so, real-time estimation of the yeah. reproduction number in particular is critical, like uh, to see uh, if our interventions are good enough to contain the, the pan pandemic yeah. or not. Exactly. So a lot of people are scared about the privacy concerns about this uh, this application. Uh -huh. um, so yeah, I think DP32 uh, is like excellent, but uh, maybe it's still hard for some people uh, to, to 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 estimate the, the privacy concerns. And I think it's interesting to to compare this with the privacy. Uh, leaks that we have by using other kinds of applications. All right. And particularly, you can think of Google or Facebook, uh, oh. or Amazon or Tinder or whatever, like all the apps uh, you're using on your phone. DP3T is designed to violate a teeny, tiny, tiny, tiny fraction <laughs> of the privacy that you are leaking through these other so, apps. Some friends, uh, all of them academics on Facebook, were discussing the, the the, the privacy concerns with DP3T, and uh, they just say yeah, exactly that. Like uh, this is a fraction. So you're here. You are giving your real names, etc., location, and lots of. So if you see the allowance you would give to 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 DP3T, it's like it's epsilon. It's like tiny and microscopic compared to the allowance. 
So, so people are, are now ranting against uh, the privacy concerns with DPG3 using social media that is already yeah. uh, they, they publish in rants yeah. on Facebook, which is a bit yeah. Yeah, weird. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I think it's important to, to have a more quantitative approach to these notions mm. of privacy. Exactly. Uh, because if we don't, like we, we can miss out on the, the fact that yeah, yeah, there are going to be privacy leaks, but they are so negligible compared to what you're giving away to to other apps. And maybe the counterpart of this is that uh, right now there's a lot of uncertainty about a lot of things going on. Like, for instance, uh, like are people following rules? Like, how many people are there outside today uh, in uh, New York City or, or whatever city you think you're yeah. having in mind? And uh, like. Uh, like I haven't seen uh, Google, Facebook, and, and so on being involved in these kind of thinkings, even though they have data that are so relevant to this. Uh, actually, Google published and Apple published mobility reports, aggregated oh, yeah, yeah. mobility I've reports. Today, actually. Sorry, yeah. I missed that. Yeah, I've, I've missed it. Well, I've just seen it today, actually, but yeah. Uh, that, that's, uh, that's helpful that we, we could have better data. So. And yeah. they also now published uh, a machine readable version of that data for researchers. So CSVs, okay, cool. et cetera, yeah. instead of PDFs. Uh, it's a bit counterintuitive because you, so in, in proximity tracing, you can you can just let the app know if you met person this like if Alice met Arno, but it won't need to know where they met, the location where they met. E even though some countries are, are using location tracing. We might argue that that's not necessary. So you only need to know if if A met B. You don't necessarily need to know where they met, and uh, what did they say, or what did they uh, talk to each other. So, so so with way less data, which is it just whether A met B, uh, you can have valuable epidemiologic uh, information. W w while social networks are are are. Uh, accessing way more data and not necessarily giving researchers anything to, to use. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's a, an application by MIT called the private kit where you uh, actually have uh, uh, exploit uh, GPS uh, data to, mm -hmm. to contact mm -hmm. tracing. So somehow I think it's a bit of a shame that uh, the there's so much data about these companies and uh, unfortunately maybe like, I don't know all the details, but maybe these companies did not do enough effort in trying to work with health agencies and help them. Uh, but maybe on the other hand, uh, researchers did not do uh, the effort of going to these companies and asking them. Uh, I know there's a lot of, uh, of legal concerns also uh, in doing this, especially on the GDPR. Uh, it's quite a complicated problem, but given the, the scale of the problem right now, like would hope that there could be more kinds of uh, fruitful collaborations along these lines. Uh, next week, we will be talking on uh, other uh, uh, AI algorithms that can help uh, fighting the, the COVID disease in particular to uh, test uh, different proteins, uh, different molecules, uh, and, uh, and do, do the research uh, for, I guess, vaccines. The, these are a few ideas listed by uh, Jürgen Schmidhuber, who is uh, uh, one of the founding fathers, like the most uh, influential uh, researchers, especially on neural networks. Good, bye.